Good evening. And first, I'm extremely sorry um, for being late. It Traffic was one part of the reason. Uh, but the other part was that I was swamped in what's happening in Manipur. And um, I was up most of the night reporting on the video that I think most of you would have seen. And while I don't want to spoil your evening, you're out for a nice evening, you're out for a nice conversation. When I was driving here, I was thinking, it's so ironic that we've gathered here today to talk about how too much government possibly actually holds India back. But what about the moments that you want more government? What about the moments that you need more government? And Subhashish, uh, the last time I felt like that was when I was traveling across India reporting on the pandemic. And I thought it's such a contradiction. Sometimes I want less government and sometimes I want more government. And in Manipur, uh, I can tell you that the women of Manipur in particular have waited for their government to speak to them. So sometimes you need, you need the benevolence of the superstructure. And I just want to start because it would feel very wrong to me to start this evening with anything but asking about Manipur for you to address that paradox. Absolutely, Barkha. And I think um, even as I was writing this book, um, I think the point I try to make through all of that is that at the end of the day, I don't think we care so much about, like we I don't think we are driven by ideology of most of us are driven by ideology of less government or more government we want government to just be effective in many ways I think a quote unquote smaller government is also a government that we can possibly hold more to account what I mean and by doing fewer things you might get better at doing those fewer things uh, I was uh, I saw your tweet earlier today about um, the emails that you received in terms of taking down those videos um, and can, I, can I just give context yes, to the absolutely. audience that may not know? Very short version of the story. Please raise your hand if you've seen the Manipur video that we're talking about. I if you you started seeing it, you couldn't complete it. May I may I just say in brief so that you have context for what we're talking about? The video is two months old. Uh, it shows two young women being stripped to the skin and paraded naked uh, by a mob of men who is also shoving and pushing them. Uh, people are just watching this happen and um, the video shows two women but there was a third woman who was also gang raped. She was 21. Her brother was 19 and he died trying to save his sister. And this is uh, a video incident that took place on the 4th of May but the video, the video has surfaced last night and it has changed the discourse. This morning the Prime Minister and the Chief Justice of India both spoke on this video and they said... It wasn't just about the video, it was about justice for these women. And in a few hours, the main accused was arrested. In a few hours, which leads you to ask, what was happening? Where was that government, big or small, on the 4th of May, on the 18th of May, when the FIR is filed and so on? And fast forward to, I've been pretty much on this story since last night. And um, we were interviewing a, a woman who broke down in tears and she she said, Will India finally stand with us? I would rather die than go through what the women in this video went through. This evening before coming here, we received a notice from the Ministry of Information, uh, Technology and Electronics uh, that as per 69A, as per 69A uh, we were in violation of the law and we needed our videos. All of our coverage of Manipur could be possibly taken down. I wrote a very strong email back and I said that I understood as a journalist with 30 years of experience that you were not supposed to obviously identify the women. You were obviously not supposed to show graphic sexual abuse. We had censored all of that. Those who haven't should be blocked. But if you block us for doing our work, then you are blocking our reportage of Manipur. Now, this context is for me to ask the question, is this too much government, too little government or simultaneously both? Ironically, simultaneously both because the interesting thing is, uh, when someone like you receives uh, a notice, now some might argue and legitimately argue that, look, a video like this can, even when obfuscated, can lead to uh, um, aggravate the law and order situation in the country, in, in the region. But at the same time, someone else might argue that, look, this is a matter of journalistic freedom about people, citizens of the country knowing what actually happened. Both are legitimate arguments. And how do we find the balance between those legitimate arguments is the question. Section 69A, interestingly, something which 
uh, any government, and obviously this government did not introduce it. There's a previous government that introduced the Congress it. government, which is a big couple civil project. Exactly. So when a Section 69A is invoked, the government can unilaterally, essentially, or on its own, send you this notice. Uh, I you posted the screenshot which said, "Look, the exact order cannot be shared with you." So it doesn't even leave you in a position to necessarily challenge it very effectively in a court of law. It's very interesting that these very nuanced decisions about freedom of speech, about uh, journalistic freedoms, which are questions of fundamental rights, can happen without any kind of court over, like the courts intervening or even opining on these questions. Uh, and that's essential, that captures the crux of what I'm tr trying to say in the book, that as a country, we have all of these competing perspectives, competing interests, etc. And we need to find the right institutional mechanisms for that to happen. So before, for example, that such a notice could be sent, it should perhaps at least have some level of um, a court uh, seeing all of that and then opining on whether it's... Dialogue. You know, if somebody were to say, okay, if you do this, you can keep your story. But if you show this, you can't keep your story. A dialogue. Exactly. And like what is allowed, what is not allowed and those kind of things. So that was one reflection I had. The second reflection is just how you now one might uh, there might be many reasons for why was action taken just now and why wasn't taken earlier but I think it also raises the larger question of police independence uh, and this the police system that we've inherited was is essentially from the 1860s it is essentially a colonial police structure wherein you know the 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 police is so deeply uh, beholden to the political masters at the state level that I think they have very little functional or on major things have relatively limited functional autonomy. And I think to that extent, uh, this is also a reflection of that, that perhaps a, a less government, which is a government that did not control the police so deeply, might, might have perhaps led to different outcomes than the one that we saw. So the less government, more government paradox is only one of the many paradoxes of India that you so brilliantly capture in, in the book. And what I really like about the book is that in this very polarized time where families are divided by WhatsApp debates and arguments and, you know, intergenerational quarrels are happening, you actually make an attempt to transcend uh, the left-right binary. Now, I know this from being a journalist that when I try and do that, of course, there's some issues I feel very strongly about and I take a position on those. But in many other ways, I think of my job as a professional chronicler and I want the facts to speak for themselves. But when one does that, you actually somehow manage to offend both sides, right? Uh, I, I want to ask you why you are hopeful that we can actually have a conversation about our country today that transcends our left-right divisions. So firstly, I, 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 someone very wise and someone who I look up to once told me, if you're getting abused by both sides, you're probably doing something right. Um, but apart from that, I also think as uh, people who are really concerned about uh, the state of the country and want it to be in a good position, I also don't think we have choice. I don't think a deeply polarized country benefits either of the sides. And we there's enough evidence coming out of the US for this, but I'm sure it's true in India just not being studied, which is that when you have polarization, you have log jams, you have so much social disunity that it makes any kind of policy making difficult. One of the things I really admire about how we have built our country is that on many aspects, I think there's a broad consensus. On foreign policy, there's broad consensus in India. On even economic policy, I would say there's broad consensus. Um, I think the age of social media has really magnified a lot of these social cleavages that we used to have, a pre-existing social cleavages. And I think I, as a country, I genuinely believe that we have no choice but to try to find that common ground. I, I think it's fantastic that you do that because before I ask the next question, uh, raise your hand if you've lost a friend because of a political position. It doesn't matter what the political position is. Raise, raise your hand if you have. So that's about four, five, ten hands going up. And I'd love to hear more as we open the floor for questions. Um, Let's talk about something happy because we started on such a depressing note. Your book talks about the things that work in India. You know, a lot of your videos that you've done, very interesting Instagram feed. Please do look up his Instagram feed. Talk about all the things that make us proud as Indians and the moon mission. I mean, the number of the, the you know, the, it, it was goes bumpy, right? Uh, you talk about how we hold elections, the peaceful transfer of power from a winner to a loser. Uh, how we have kept our people relatively safe in an extremely volatile neighborhood. There are things that work. Let's talk about the top three things that work. 
I mean, I think the the first and most important thing is just our electoral democracy. Uh, to the extent that we are able to do elections, just time in time out, and no matter how much we say during election time that this might be rigged and these are the biases, I think the losers almost invariably accept the the decision. And this is what Ramchandra Guha called the most reckless experiment in human history, and that experiment has played out very well. So I think that certainly makes me uh, uh, extremely proud as an Indian. Uh, the second thing is our ability to deliver economic growth. uh for a citizen and for a country of our size i don't think that is necessarily that that is not trivial right and we took many hard decisions along the way we came out of crises as an economy and i think that really makes me very proud the third thing which i have to say because i'm from bangalore is that i think um just the hustle and the drive and the entrepreneurship that uh some especially some of our younger folks show in this country is very inspiring because at the end of the day they are the ones who are battling this bureaucracy day in day out they are the ones who are running from pillar to post uh for a license for different things and the fact that we've been able to build businesses here uh which stand toe to toe with global giants is really inspiring and of course one of the big pluses you count is eradication of polio i just uh, just remember that as well then you look at the things that don't work right and you look at things ranging from uh, rice production uh to how many people have had to pay a bribe and if i'm remembering this incorrectly correct me but 39% of indians have said that they've had to pay a bribe and that's obviously the percentage that is admitting to this so we can assume that 50% of indians have had to pay a bribe right um and that's an institutional question that's a structural question it has nothing to do with ideology absolutely and this is what i call the dichotomy of india right if we take these big projects when we have to do the kumbh mela we do like the we organize something as large as that we organize something as large as our elections we move this country forward economically so when it comes to these large missions i think we are relatively successful when we run things in quote and quote mission mode but that's the starting premise of this book that that mission mode success is often very different from our day to day lived experiences as indians the air we breathe the pollution that we have here the productivity we have in agriculture bribes we pay um and whole bunch of other um, things where we see on a day to day level our lived experiences in india is very different and then that's the question i ask how come we are so good at doing these big things these grand narratives and relatively weak as a flailing bureaucracy of kinds to to solve day to day issues for our citizenry and that's where i think the role of institutions becomes important because there's not good, you know we often when we think of big projects and we think hey let's get some great guy from the public or the private sector to lead it and he's going to drive it or she's going to drive it things if you want to improve citizens life it cannot be done in mission mode we really have to work on the nuts and bolts of our bureaucracy of our judicial system etc to make that happen uh, and that's the starting uh, point of this book so before we delve deeper into that let's do a thought experiment with all of you gathered here um is is there a mic and if there isn't a mic this project uh What do you think anybody are in their top 3 things that work and top 3 things that don't work? Anyone? Three things that work? I mean, you heard uh Subhashish list uh, a few of them. Anyone wants to take what works? Yeah. yeah. I think what works in India is our ability to have belief and faith. Okay. That's, that's the most important thing because we Indians have this absolutely you know 100% belief and faith that things would work out in spite of everything going around us like what we saw in 2020 and 2021 the world was ending but somehow that this faith was enough and this inherent belief was enough that you know there could be a sun rise after this dark night so i i believe for indians which is what glues us together is our belief system and the faith system and and what and, and what doesn't it... and because that's not an institutional answer and and that's my 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 one p with so which which i'll come to that everything's not answered by institutions something that is intangible yes. like what it feels like to be in you yes and and what can it work for us i believe the biggest thing is our fear of institutions we we have this uh, somehow this uncanny feeling and fear of institution i like a businessman somebody takes me for a ride and he owes me like 50 lakh rupees for me it's much easier to write it off and sleep then you go to the judiciary or go to the authorities when i have all the evidence in supporting yeah so that is these are two things you know which work for me but i would still stick to the faith and belief part because that what is driving the country we have absolutely faith so interesting anyone else anyone else at the back there yes oh also here we'll here and then there yeah um how about public private institutions like sports and cricket okay 
as examples of work or not work, I was wondering. I mean, things that work. Okay. All right. At the back there. Yes. Uh, first here. Can you stand up so we can get to the mic? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I'm short in any case, so I had to stand up. <laughs> So I would say, I mean, I know, agree with what you had said, right, in terms of hope and acceptance of the system. And also, I would say that at some level, letting go and choose the fights that you want to fight. Because the, what I had felt is that the whole system, while of course, it's been running for so many years, but at a lot of levels, it's so overwhelming for you to try and stay out and continue to do your bit and gain from it and give back in whatever way possible. But yeah, to fight it out at any level, I think I'm 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 maybe too weak as an individual to even try to think of it. Sorry? Oh, no, maybe I... there's an interesting <laughs> point about it can be called fatalism, it can be called resilience, it can be called philosophical acceptance. I don't know. It depends on your point of view. I'll take one more comment then I want to go back to Subhashish. There at the back, I've, I can see someone with their hand raised. Could you stand? Maybe we can get to the mic then. Yeah, okay. Good evening. Hi. Uh, so in my experience, for the most part, the organization, uh, the structure of the armed forces works. Uh, what doesn't work is the speed at which justice gets delivered. You've said you've given two great examples, and you're a Navy boy, right? Let's let's talk about the armed forces. I saw three days ago the army having to be called in to to repair a breach in a drain. Right? The, the civil engineers couldn't do it. The army was called in to repair the breach in a drain. If that breach had not been fixed, then the Supreme Court of India would have been flooded. On the other side, the army in Manipur, I don't know how many of you know that, is today playing the bridge between the Kuki and the Methi, the clashing ethnic communities. It's hosting the conversations with the community leaders. Neither of these are the army's job descriptions, but it comes to trust. I think that is the point. The trust in institutions, even today, every poll will tell you every Indian believes in the military or the armed forces, the trust factor. Um, but what was it? What, what, what did you say did not work? Justice. Bhavri Devi, right? Uh, a Dalit woman from Rajasthan, gang raped about 30 years ago when I first stepped into journalism. Uh, I don't know how many of you know. She was a poor, illiterate woman. She was gang raped. Her case went all the way to the Supreme Court. What we today recognize all you guys have posh head committees in your workplaces. You know, you understand the sexual harassment guideline. They all came from this case. They all came from the fight of a poor Dalit woman in Rajasthan who could not get justice for herself. Her case is still on 30 years later. But while her case was being heard, the Supreme Court decided, oh, she was doing her work because she was gang raped for trying to stop a child marriage. She was a government employee, gang raped for trying to stop a child marriage of a one-year-old. Among the rapists was the one-year-old's father. She never got justice. But from her case, Indian women got rules that protect them at the workplace. I give you these examples because they, you know, on the one hand, this institution that's loved, respected, and called to do everything that a civil administration should be doing. On the other hand, the slow wheels of justice. Absolutely. And as I think of what makes, the, what has made, kept that institution so effective and so respected, Part of it is because it is perceived to be quote unquote above the kind of the political sphere. Right? It's it's seen as largely apolitical. But also, I think there are both structural as well as normative, um, um, you know, rules that have prevented or protected that institution from being diluted away. So, for what I mean that by that is obviously there's this culture of independence in the army, in the armed forces in general, to be away from political quest, uh, questions and the political. Uh, experiences. So there have been famous stories of even in Indira Gandhi's time where the army refused to step in because they said this is not our domain to do so. So I think that independence of institutions is something that is also a thread that I believe should have been seen in a lot more. But for example, if you see the police versus army contrast, I think a lot of it just boils down to that. Um, at the same time, the army is accountable uh, to the, the political class. I don't think they've like become a power of their own like they have in Pakistan. Uh, and I think, therefore, that model of how do you build accountability while at the same time protect autonomy of institutions becomes really important. I think where, for example, in the judicial system, uh, we also see that all these, like the judiciary itself is not necessarily in control of so many things. In Starting from judicial appointments, we've seen so much back and forth. Uh, judicial infrastructure, budgets, etc. are still in the hands of the government. 
And therefore, I think it's even though perhaps at the topmost level in the Supreme Court, we still see a lot of um, kind of those give and takes with the government, what I mean, like the push and pulls of democracy, we see a lot more effectively. But I think the judiciary below that has withered under the stress of uh, the number of cases that they have to deal with without necessarily having the supporting infrastructure. So I think the um, the great point that was brought about about these institutions that work and don't work has to at some level do with the kind of independence that these institutions enjoy. Now, the big raging debate about whether institutions today are weaker than they were before. One of the things you, you, you point out in your book is that everything we see is happening today has actually happened before. So we talk about a BBC documentary that's blocked. We can go back to Indira Gandhi's time and BBC was actually banned from India for two years. You talk about, uh, you know, um, free speech and you can talk about Nehru's First Amendment to the Constitution. Basically, every moment, if you go back far enough, in some ways has occurred before. Why, what stands between deepening the freedom of these institutions? Like, what what is the obstacle to deepening them? I mean, I believe that India's democracy, electoral democracy, is very healthy. I believe what happens between elections is less healthy. <laughs> absolutely. And I, I think that is absolutely the, the, the right point. So here's a couple of things. So one is that while, yes, it is true that everything that happened now has happened in the past, and I think that's a point I repeatedly make through book and whenever I speak about it, but there's also the point that over time institutions tend to decay. They, it tends to get worse because once an example is set, it's easier to replicate, right? So it's every time you're kind of pushing the boundary a little bit about how much can I as a person in power go and that that's it's an example for everyone else. The one major example I see of citizens reclaiming that power in a way was the RTI movement uh, where we might argue that it's not been as successful as it should have been, but I think it was still a very remarkable journey of uh, citizens actually reclaiming some of that power from the government. And now I think about what cause in a democracy like India, the only real way for citizens to kind of start reclaiming that or even change the nature of institutions is by some sort of political mobilization, uh, which is if as soon as things become political issues, we see some sort of a response come and perhaps some uh, bargaining that is done. And yet the paradox is that you argue that though this is a very politically conscious generation, people are hesitant to express their opinion. Absolutely. And I think we saw that during the CA, um, uh, NRC and CA protests wherein a lot of young people participated. Um, but the challenge is that once that kind of died down, I think many, many of those, especially the younger people, kind of went back to that. I think there are two the reasons why they don't participate as much. One is fear, uh, not necessarily even of the government or anything like that, but fear of even, you know, career progression and stuff like that being affected because you are seen as a quote-unquote political person. Um, and the second is a sense of futility, that things are not, nothing will change. Um, and I think that's what I'm also trying to argue through this book, that look, at the end of the day, things don't, in a democracy of India's size, won't change in a year, two years, even a decade. It's a lifelong struggle that we live as, as citizens to try to make it better generation by generation. The other important thing to understand is that all democracies are imperfect. If we look at the United States of America, it has a deep, deep institutional uh, freedom when it comes to speech. It, it, it's very deeply believed, it's very deeply held. But it's the same deepness that they attach to wielding a gun. So the First Amendment captures what's great and the Second Amendment captures what's crazy about America. Exactly. And... These are um, the essential trade-offs that you make in terms of how you design the architecture of, of the, the, the country, starting with the constitution. And that's something that America chose to create its architecture in a way that, because they were so um, skeptical of centralized power, that they, I think they built so many checks and balances, it's really difficult to do anything there. Uh, even the number of times, especially in these polarized times, the number of times anyone cross votes has just come down incredibly. So I think they built it because they were so skeptical of centralized power. We, because we were born at the time of partition as a country, uh, we believe that, look, we need a centralizing force to keep the country together. And that's how we designed the architecture. So definitely the right choices to make uh, in 1947. But I don't think necessarily the right choices in uh, 2023. For example, For example uh, one of the things that uh, we have from the time of independence is uh, the kind of the police system reporting into the... Um, uh, into the political uh, executive, which is what we inherited from the British. But at the time of independence, we also thought that 
uh, this is something that we must retain so that we are able to deal with the chaos of that time. We most importantly, I think the most contentious part was around sedition, uh, was around preventive detention and these were laws that were heavily debated and in fact one might even argue done away with by the Constituent Assembly uh, but were then brought in through the First Amendment and other, other back doors, right? So at that point, uh, obviously Nehru felt the need that hey to pre you know to protect friendly relations with Pakistan and for a whole, you know because there was an immigration crisis from uh, East Bengal to deal with all of that you needed a much uh, a lot more leeway for the government uh, to be able to deal with these kind of things but I think that those set of institutional design choices have now percolated down have become fairly expansive. Uh, so to the to the to the point that I was making initially that the fact that the government can curtail freedom of speech and journalistic freedom on its own without judicial scrutiny, I think in many ways owes its origins to the government at some point deciding that, look, I need a lot more flexibility to be able to deal with the situation. You uh, very interestingly join dots between unexpected events. So, for example, you look at Rahul Gandhi's disqualification and the law around that, uh, and that hearing begins at the Supreme Court tomorrow, and then you connect it to the Me Too movement. Can you tell us that story? So the, the, the dot that I draw between these two incidents is the use of criminal defamation as a means of coercion by by the powerful against people who might not be as powerful. In the Me Too movement, of course, it was by one of the accused who used that. Uh, exactly. Uh, and that was, that that instrument or that law of criminal defamation was obviously threatened and then eventually uh, thankfully the court stepped in and threw that out and that is exactly what we're seeing in the Rahul Gandhi case where there's a criminal defamation case. Now the larger question I ask and which I think all of us should be asking is in in a disagreement between two individuals why does one of them need to go to jail? And which is exactly what other countries have done away with. In fact when even I mean, the Britishers obviously did away with it long time ago, but even when the Kenyans did away with it, the Supreme Court called it uh, essentially like one of the worst things that you can do to individual autonomy is to jail someone just because they said something that another person finds defamatory. Uh, so I think that was the common link. And I think we as a, as a, we often don't draw these parallels because we might think of the Rahul Gandhi issue as a kind of political issue between a political executive, etc. But I think there's a larger narrative of how are these... How are the same set of colonial laws now being used in sp space after space to essentially clamp down on any kind of uh, dissent against the powerful? Before we open it up for more questions, let's talk about something that's very current, the Uniform Civil Code. Now, as a feminist, as a woman, I actually intuitively support the idea of a Uniform Civil Code. I think it makes sense that there should be a set of rights that should exist across religions, across communities. Uh, but this is a very, very polarizing conversation. Even those who will say, in principle, I support, but I'm not going to The ambient sound is too polarizing. It's a uh, stick to beat Muslims with. There are many things we hear about it. How do we remove the political noise and have a dispassionate conversation about the uniform civil code? So before I, I get to that, uh, much like you, I think I also believe that the UCC debate is a good time for us as a country to start reflecting on the ways in which the government intervenes in our religious lives. Because that also I might... In our personal lives. In our personal lives. Yes. Religion being one part of it. Yes. Um, and as uh, uh, another Bloomsbury author Rajiv Bhargav says that the only role that the government should play within uh, any religious uh, regulation or religious society is to prevent do inter intra group domination. So if gender-based domination or caste-based domination, that should be the only role that the government plays. Mm. Now, so I, therefore, I welcome the conversation. As you rightly said, it's going to be extremely polarized no matter when that happens. And therefore, how do we take the polarization out of the conversation is, I believe, through a transparent public consultation process. Which is to say, here's my draft UCC. So firstly, obviously, nobody knows what is the proposal on the ground. Uh, and you put a draft UCC out in public, get public comments, put all the public comments as well out in public do a second draft, it's going to be a long process and that's the part of democracy. Like uh, Tathagat Satpati, I think at one point said, look, we are in the business of making laws, not selling soap. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, so I do think that public consultation process is the only way to take allegations of bias, discrimination, etc. out of it because you say, hey, look, the government received 2,000 comments. 1,500 of them were supportive on ABC provisions which were then brought into the law and that I think also solves for the problem of democracy between elections. Because this is, I think, how democracy is there between elections. I 
one last question for your book before we, I promise to open it up after that, which is that, you know, you make an interesting point about economics and you say that though it looks like people are left and right, they're not left and right on economics anymore. That there seems to be a broad consensus on what any government's economic policy will be. Um, Mr. Modi, who is seen as right of center, is not an economic conservative, right? And he actually believes in a kind of welfare capitalism. He's created an entire class now of people, the Bharti class. The welfare schemes are a key factor in his political success. Do you believe that maybe other than uh, maybe other than the communists, there is large agreement on the on the economic policy that it doesn't matter who will form the government, Indians can expect a continuity in economic policy? I believe so. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's always a good thing. I think, for example, um, how economics 101 is that the role of the government should be to provide public goods. And now instead of public goods, we provide publicly subsidized private goods. Uh, and that, I think, is a transformation that has happened in the previous... Like electricity. Like electricity, like uh, cooking gas. Uh, I believe in Tamil Nadu, there's also been like... Uh, tea, exactly. Ideas. Exactly. So public, private goods provided publicly. Um, and I think that shift has happened. But even around that, there's now great consensus uh, with, for example, the Ahmadmi party introducing free electricity that's now being copied by the Congress. And I think it's a matter of time before it becomes fairly common, which is in perhaps in that isolated case, a good thing. But yes, there is some level of economic continuity that I think all of us as Indians will now look forward to just because that and foreign policy are the two places where I think we have the greatest consensus. Okay. Let's open this up. Um, as you probably gathered from the conversation, the book, you know, looks at literally every aspect of public policy uh, and has some very interesting data points, very interesting talking points. Uh, but let's open this up. If anything leaps out at you, otherwise let me let me put a question. Uh, what do you look for when you vote? What do you look for as a voter when you vote? How many of you vote? Like, so that's 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 many of you. So does anybody, because we heard a lot about like belief, trust, cynicism, fatalism, right? Institutions. So what do you look for when you vote? Is it ideology? Are you are you governed by an ide ideological position? Are you looking for a delivery of services? Are you looking at your politician almost as a corporate entity that I voted you deliver? Anybody wants to take that? Yeah, at the back. If you could stand, then I think it will be easier to get the mics to you. Yes. I got the mic first. I'm here. Can you stand? Because we can barely see you from here. I'm very tall. But uh, now I said. So a couple of things from my side. Um, I vote because I believe in the system of democracy. That's the first thing. If I didn't believe in the system of democracy, I wouldn't have gone and voted. And then I make the second choice to say that who do I vote for? And that's where the trust and ideology comes. So in your first question that you answer, asked, I actually believe the biggest asset that India has today is the power of democracy to be able to come and sustain in the system like this with the scale and the population and the diversity of, of you know, what we have today. Because, you know, as you rightly said, in, in the U.S., in spite of having a majority, the government cannot do a lot many things that the Indian government can do. So that's fundamentally number one. Secondly, you know, the fact that, you know, the schemes, there are a lot of people in taxpayer community who feel that, you know, these government schemes are very politically oriented, etc. But you also must recognize the fact that when you have a country of this size, there will always be 10 to 15 percent to 20 percent people on the marginalized side, which have to be taken care of. And to that extent, justification of these schemes, etc. is very, very relevant. Otherwise, there'll be a very polarized society so that it will become actually a capitalist society. So very honestly, I don't find anything wrong. The fact that there is public policy, the fact that, you know, systems are in place, the fact that constitution to uh, parliament has this concept of parliamentary committees, which are supposed to examine each of these laws, debate it out, have public consultation, the, the things are all there. It doesn't work for different reasons and that needs to be solved for rather to say that oh, democracy is bad, oh, this is bad, oh, there's no public consultation, there's no process like that, oh, or the police is sort of, you know, reporting to this agency versus that particular agency. I don't think that's that's the issue. The issue is that systems and processes and everything have been designed well. Now, why are they not working? 
there is a high handedness of some you know elements etc solve for those is where i think my point is uh, do do you want to uh, respond to that the structurally everything is healthy it's the execution the gap is in the execution not the design and i i can see a hand up in the front in the meantime lots of hands in the front but we'll take one at the back and then come to the front go ahead for someone I, i absolutely agree that i think we have the super structure uh, and the uh, of democracy or the exoskeleton of democracy built very well um but it is also true that i think people have had to fight for it uh, or argue for it so even parliamentary committees as an example that you brought up were only introduced in the 1990s um and some people will argue hey look you know because of this design feature they are not as effective or whatever else and those are conversations we will have in the democracy uh, but i think uh, where uh, i do completely agree is that whatever said and done i think democracy as even as it is practiced in india does give us the ability to voice these etc such that things become better parliamentary committees rti um the, the kind of anti corruption movement etc and you if we don't meet full success but even that little bit incremental success we we meet every time i think gets us to a better place okay uh, yes here yeah. i i come to the back of that yeah uh the question which i had was that you know if uh, democracy is needed to build these institutions which i do believe it is uh now that you look back over like 70 plus years of our history has there been like better institution building in those times when uh certain kinds of politics or certain kind of democratic processes were there so for instance uh there was this wave of emergency where actually democracy receded right and institutions also were really compromised and so is there like a ebb and flow of some of this that we see in india and is it true like some of people are now saying that it's during the times of coalition governments and the times of when it seems like a chaotic democracy is when really real institutions are built so if i look at rti for example the last thing that you talked about if i talk about aadhar which is another instance of a real institution which has got built probably reduced uh corruption of uh, certain kinds all right those things came out when there was a like a coalition government uh and not like a government which had so much power that they really don't need public consensus they don't need a consultative process etc so so i'll make two points so that i think in general having greater distribution of power in a democracy usually leads to better outcomes so to the extent that the judiciary might feel more empowered in certain times and therefore bring certain changes which might not be which might not happen in other times those that kind of distribution of power between center and state between judiciary and executive between different political parties etc are typically relatively creative times um and and a lot more thoughtful because there's kind of that debate however in an indian context i think what's also important is because there's so many institutions they play in somewhat unpredictable ways for example um while uh, you know we talk about the 1970s is probably some sort of a, a downward slope in our democratic process uh but i think eventually over a few years a few decades later in the mid 1990s was when for example the supreme court stepped up and put some guardrails around the role of the governor's office and before that state governments used to be like dismissed left right and center and i think that that put some stop to that and has at least put some sort of a friction uh, in that process so the point i'm making is that because these ebbs and flows or strengthening and weakening of democratic processes in india take place in a relatively kind of unpredictable way so except if you kind of put the emergency period out i think at the same time at any point in time in our uh, country you will see processes that are strengthening democracy and processes that are weakening it at the same time um at the back yes hello hi my name is aryan and so i'll start my question with two terms one is complex systems and the other is simplicity now there is a very famous phrase that is known or i personally believe in it is that the inertia of institutions in india is very very high and on the other hand if we think of complex systems complex systems have a lot of depth and in the sense that they can function very quickly and have a high fluidity for example we consider our brain so our neural systems are very complex very advanced but they function very quickly on the other hand the inertia of indian institutions they are very deep very complex but the mass of those institutions is so heavy because of some of the other factors that they don't function very properly or effectively so what is that mass that is causing the inertia of indian institutions to be so high and the second part is like the um, like 
my point to the previous question that was asked. So I wanted to say that an interesting system or an institution that works in India is called the Jugaad system, in which we make shift things, like quickly do things. Ki, agar aisa nahi bhi ho ra, we can just kuch to kari lenge. So that system. So if that institution functions very quickly in India, effectively in India, and at the same time we have complex systems which are not working in India. It's actually a very interesting point about agility and inertia, right? Why are some things so agile and why are some things so inert? So I think it's a it's a fantastic question and, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, to your question of what causes that system, I hope a when we when we start with um, the premise that look on average it works very well and. I don't think inertia necessarily is a bad thing, right? I think again we are not in the we are in the process of making policy, not in the process of manufacturing soap. So it takes time. That's a good thing. Uh, sometimes inertia is good. Sometimes the consultative slow process, etc., is good. Um, the challenge that I think uh, what all of us sometimes face is there's not as much of a citizen centricity and ease of citizen in in a bureaucrat's mind as they're thinking kind of, because they're still wound in the processes from a colonial time when the processes were meant to be chains rather than uh, to be facilitative and i think that's the switch in thinking that we need to constantly push for is that instead of thinking of us as subjects uh, in, uh, one of the things that i find very remarkable about our country is we think of it as upa rule nda rule and i'm like why are we using the word rule like in the us you think of them as administrations um so look long story short i don't think any system is perfect uh, to the extent that our systems have inertia i don't think it's necessarily bad i think the switch we need to make is in terms of most citizen centricity and but to quickly answer your question about this dichotomy about uh, agility in some and inertia in others i think it boils down to where is the where are where are their vested interests v the place where we have built an architecture of vested interest tend to be more uh, have more inertia so farm laws for example uh, you might argue whatever but the point is that there were so many vested interests involved that even someone as powerful uh, as the current dispensation could not do much about it and where there is not as much vested interest where people don't have money at play i think there's a lot more agility because the state is somewhat absent from that and i think that explains the paradox question here yeah yeah I think it does. I mean, sometimes it's easy to take it for granted that, you know, elections actually run properly. My question to you is that in the last few years with AI, ML and social media, is it truly as successful or is there a covert way where it's been handled not so obviously by rigging, but by, you know, doing things at the back end, still getting the results that they want? And what do you think is the role of, so, you know, institutions to be able to handle or curb that in certain sense? Because with the population of our size and the internet penetration, it's a done deal that if you don't control or put regulations for that, it our lives and our choices will highly be dependent on that. Absolutely. That's a great question. In fact, for your first part, I would also recommend another book called uh, The Art of Conjuring Alternate Realities. And I think that goes a lot more detailed into um, how uh, some of these, you know, mind space and narratives, and obviously we saw in the 2016 election in the US, and we can be sure it's also happening now in India and elsewhere. So all of that happens, right? And then social media obviously has the largest role to play in that. And therefore, we must regulate social media. So until now, I am with you. The question uh, is always, how do we regulate it? And I think the challenge that we've often come to uh, terms in India is that, look, uh, regulation takes the form of the government creating a set of directives and then being able to be like, hey, take down this video or do not allow posts of this nature, etc. The argument I make is any kind of regulation should have some friction. It should not be unilaterally driven by government. The pushback I often get when I make this argument is that, look, judiciary can't play this role because it's so slow. And I'm like, that's a little bit of a fatalistic argument, right? You've taken the slowness of the judiciary as a given, and instead of trying to do the hard work of fixing that, you're saying, that's a given, judiciary will not step in, now let the, uh, let the government decide how to run this. So I'm with you till the regulation part. I do think that regulation, especially of a fundamental, of a constitutionally guaranteed fundamental, right, has to have more friction, and the judiciary has to have a role to play in it. Okay, we're on our last five to ten minutes, so I'm going to go first right to the back. Yes, sir, could you please stand? I can see you from here. But yes. So, so, so building on friction, agility, inertia, right? Purely from your economics expertise, right? What do you, how do you comment on jerks like demonetization, right? Like where jerks are placed in the system, 
where the whole system becomes unstable, right? What's your comment on that? So one thing, one thing I try to be somewhat clever about in this book is to stay away from a judgment on most of these things, including demonetization. But instead, look at what was the context and the story behind demonetization. The RBI as an institution, um, at the time of demonetization, had so many vacant seats for independent board members that, in effect, it had a majority of government nominees on the board. Now, that kind of an institution is not well set up to even consider a proposal like demonetization in great detail. Again, not specific to this government. In fact, one of the earliest RBI governors of independent India once said, I'm a department of the government. And central banks cannot be run in that way, right? So, therefore, to, to, your, to your point, the reason demonetization ha and other things happen relatively quickly and without as much friction is because we haven't set up as many independent institutions in the country. A lot of the institutions still are under the thumb of any gov or central or state government. So that's, I think, something that we will probably need to change. Okay, I saw some hands go up in the middle. Anyone here? Otherwise, since we're close, anyone there who hasn't had a chance? And then, yes, ma'am, first you. Yeah. Thanks, Barkha. Uh, Barkha had made this point while talking to you where she said that a lot of what we are seeing today has happened in the past. There have been parallels in the past, right? And um, I, I don't think it's a question of what about. It's more a question of that there were gaps in the institutions then. Yeah. And those gaps in institutions stay now. So my question, Subhashish, is that um, has what has improved? You know, are there things that have improved? What has driven those improvements? And what sort of your optimistic view of how more could improve from here on and don't and don't tell us we need to work at it <laughs> that goes without saying but what what else do you think need could happen yeah thank you uh, i think that's a great question because at the end of um, any such interaction over the book i often get asked so is everything lost uh, in a sense and i don't think so i think at the end of all of it i still feel extremely optimistic and the reason i say that at a very basic level is as a country comes out of the Bijli, uh, uh, Roti, uh, Makan kind of argument, that's when they start thinking about the larger things of autonomy, freedoms, etc. become a lot more ingrained or people start demanding those things, demand par participation in processes, demand transparency, people become a lot more demanding. And in fact, there's evidence, there's econometric evidence that as people start just start asking more questions, governance becomes better. So to that extent, I think with uh, social media, uh, and with every, with all the ways in which now we have more of a voice, I do think the governments are becoming more responsive. I take a trivial example: uh, when the TCS, the tax on uh, on collect uh, at the source, was introduced on credit cards, there was such a furore that it got basically redone in 48 hours. And now, obviously, not the most important policy question, but the fact that there is social media and the governments are now being forced to react to social media, the fact that these arrests finally got made because. Um, this horrible video came out uh, in public, I think gives me a lot more hope that there is a way for us to still utilize social media in a way that's very effective. And let's remember, like before social media became the bad guy in 2016, people were very optimistic about the power of social media to really usher in the next wave of participative democracy. And I still believe in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, social media is a whole different uh, debate for which we need another 60 minutes. I had one last question here, sir. You had the same question? Okay, we'll... Okay, one question there and then we let you round it up. Yes. Um, uh, Shubhashi, so uh, we've been discussing judiciary a lot uh, in the past few minutes that we've spent here. Um, I've had hands-on experience uh, with uh, dealing uh, with the judiciary system and uh, the police system and, um, uh, you know, uh, from the ground levels to, uh, you know, have you ever been to civil courts? I haven't. Have you, have, you, uh, have you ever gotten the chance to hear an experience of how it is uh, usually uh, around those courts and the experience or the pain people go through, uh, you know, in the duration they have to deal with all of that nonsense that happens? Uh, uh, ha the Manipur uh, thing, just because... It happened in May. We are sitting in July. Had that video not come out, the justice would not have been served. It was two months, three months. It would have gone out for years. 
and that is what happens in our judiciary system people are fighting for their basic rights for our basic requirements in our judicial system and our courts don't work at all that is one thing where our government fails and it has failed for years irrespective of who's been in power uh they just don't move what's your take on that i think you say in your book uh, you want to add add a point to that yeah yeah be a good example of something that's independent they're in fact fighting for their independence and that is in fact the only thing that probably does not work or it should work better for india to get through so that's what i'm trying to link that does autonomous independence mean better or does it not that's just what i wanted to add and yet look at the amount of hope that people carry to the judiciary it's actually sort of sad and moving and inspiring all at once right and the fact that the chief justice woke up this morning and said if you don't act we will there's also that and then there's also that pain and once again there's a paradox so you can which is why i firmly believe that unless we try to have the government out of places it shouldn't be and stop expending their mind space and resources on it and really focus on what a good government is supposed to do which is to run um, a, a good judicial system i mean unfortunately we can all sit here and i'm sure all of us will agree that justice has not yet been served i mean we've probably taken the first step after 2 months i don't think any of us will be extremely optimistic about how quickly justice will be served here um and to the point of independence um i do not think that there are a lot more facets to independence than just this right to the extent for example resource allocation does the judiciary have enough um enough resources to build more courts etc uh those things also start affecting how the judiciary can actually perform and i believe that we've had scenes where um uh chief justices have gone on stage and said look i'm somewhat helpless here uh in being able to solve this backlog of cases uh, so we need to start looking at those nuts and bolts to really get to the get to the crux of the issue but if one has to really talk about judiciary in the context of the wider questions of nation building I do think that unless we fix the judiciary we we are not going to really get to a better place. I mean there's so much to talk about we didn't talk about education we didn't talk about equality we didn't talk about so but but we can't solve all of India's problems in 60 minutes I'll let you have the last word. You know I I want to make the statement that in spite of all whatever we want to think in spite of individual cynicism we actually live in a very uh, you know free country we enjoy a whole lot of freedom which a whole lot of people all over the world don't enjoy it. to the extent we abuse now what has changed from past and now so when we used to go and vote earlier you know we used to give the vote to the government and we expected the government to go about doing its job doing its business the government used to leave me alone there were checks and balances which were in place and the government used to usually do what it is expected to do but what's happening now that the government when i go and vote to the government the government has started looking what am i watching what am i eating what how am i spending money on my credit card whom i'm spending money and god forbid they also want to look into my bedroom now so what i want end of the day when i vote to the government in our democratic process which i absolutely love and i'm very proud of is i give the vote and i want to wake up with this feeling that 9 out of 10 tweets that i reply to i end up either undoing them or deleting them why i don't i, I don't want you to think you're being watched i'm oh yes i am I I I don't I I don't want to live in this you know fear psychosis or this uncanny feeling nagging feeling that you know if I say or do something somebody would come you know the what has happened in last many years and more so in last few years that the government has started not looking at what it's doing started looking at more what we are doing so that that's the thing that I want to change when I give my valuable vote you know and thank you so much for giving this opportunity no and thank you great question and let me give you the last word on it because there's so much in there right uh, there is the paradox of a parliament that won't legislate on marital rape but uh, but won't legislate on same sex marriage either uh, there is the idea of surveillance there is the idea of the orwellian state there is the idea that someone's always looking over your shoulder there's the idea that actually if you're not surrendering to government you're surrendering to big tech because either way someone's looking at what you're doing right last thought at the end of the day i think in 1947 we as a country made a choice to have a strong government uh, b r ambedkar said i want a government stronger than the colonial british government um 
And I think we need a strong government, right? We are able to, uh, we are living in an uncertain environment. Uh, we have to lift so many people out of uh, poverty, etc. The key to liberty uh, is that along with a strong government, you also empower society to be able to stand up to that government. So to the extent that, for example, today a lot of these policy-making processes are so uh, cut off from the rest of the country, e even if there's a public consultation that happens, it happens only in English. How do we start getting people more involved into the day-to-day, -day, the between the election period, into the democratic and policy-making process, is how we strengthen society in a way that it is then able to, together with a strong government, get us on that path of liberty. And this is obviously not my wisdom. This is the wisdom that in the in the book, uh, Why Nations Fail and that series, uh, economists have said this is the only long-term path to prosperity, economic and social, is you have a strong state. But with that strong state, you also have a strong society. Well, thank you, Subhashish. This has been fascinating. Please do read his book. It really does transcend the binaries of our time, which is why it was so interesting to me. Uh, I think we're all caught in WhatsApp debates. We need to raise the bar a bit, and the book does that. Thank you very much. I don't think we should stand between you, drinks and dinner now. And once again, sorry for being late. And thank you for being a great audience.